good. Um, and as stated, um, the slides uh, as well, or at least the recording will be made distributable to everyone after the revision lecture. Okay, so would anyone like to have a crack of either you can do the full interpretation of this x-ray or just go straight to what it's exactly showing? Yeah, very good, Brianna. It's a pneumothorax. And also, if people are answering or asking questions, um, please try to put them out in the, the general chat so that everyone can kind of uh, see as well. Um, uh, I promise that this is a safe uh, environment for everyone um, and stuff, but let's move on. So the reason why I started off with pneumothorax or why also my previous predecessors start off with pneumothorax is because it kind of gets you thinking about the relevant clinical anatomy with regards to respiratory sciences. So the pleura in terms of the, um, the relevant um, sort of sac around the lungs, uh, the various microstructures within it, the muscles involved with kind of passive, or not passive, but like natural respiration and exertional ex expiration or quiet versus forced breathing as one were to kind of distinguish between the two. Uh, let me just try to answer some chats here. Uh, okay, very good. Um, now let's uh, move on. So let's talk about the pleura for a little bit. Its histology consists of a serous membrane of simple squamous cells also, uh, and it's supported by connective tissue deep to that. And the special layer of squamous cells is known as the mesothelium. So in terms of differentiating between visceral versus the parietal pleura, it, it really distinguishes by the general anatomical locations the, uh, the blood supply, um, as well as its relevant kind of anatomical neighboring structures. The parietal pleura is actually adjacent or stuck to the thoracic cage, and it's innervated by phrenic and intercostal nerves. And if the parietal pleura were to be damaged, would anyone like to try to answer if it will be a well-localized or a poorly localized kind of pain? Yeah, very good, Jonathan. It's well localized. Um, and uh, now that means that with regards to the other pleura, which is actually stuck to, as the name implies, the um, visceral or to the organ kind of pleura, is stuck to the actual lungs themselves. It's innervated by autonomic nerves from the pulmonary plexus. And as a result, the pain, if the visceral pleura were to be disrupted, would be... Um, uh, poorly localized, and his blood supplies would be bronchial arteries. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it previously, but the parietal pleura would be uh, vascularly supplied by intercostal arteries. So uh, with regards to the pleural divisions, the visceral and parietal pleura are continuous with each other, and they can, would kind of meet at the inferiorly at the hilum of the lung to kind of this kind of tear-shaped structure known as the pulmonary ligaments. But in terms of like the pneumothorax, or I guess if you want to think about it, the hemothorax is the actual space in between the pleura, the pleural cavity or the pleural space. It is, has a small volume of serous fluid, which functions to provide one, a frictionless gliding so that obviously if you don't, you don't want the, the pleura to rub each other and hurt you every time because that would be kind of counterintuitive. But also make sure that there is a level of uh, sort of glue, natural glue between the two as well, uh, but not too much so that you can still have that little bit of space to facilitate that negative pressure breathing. And in terms of pleural recesses, it can be, there's costodiaphragmatic and costomediastinal. All right, 
moving on. So now let's talk about the uh, histology in detail. So the primary histology, at least with regards to kind of gas exchange, um, it would be the type one and the, the type two pneumocytes. So the type one is more numerous and it's actually the sort of the functional cellular unit of gas exchange. So that to facilitate oxygen into the body and carbon dioxide out of the body. And the smaller but still important kind of population are the type two pneumocytes or the type two alveolar cells because you need to have that surfactant to be uh, produced in order to deal with the, the surface tension. So I don't know if you studied any kind of, uh, I guess, animal or bug biology, but if you think about the water strider and how they kind of function to kind of float and travel along water, it's applying the actual kind of physics, in this case, the biophysics of surface tension to make sure that when you inhale and exhale and when you gas exchange, the alveoli themselves, they don't collapse in on itself, at least not too much. So now let's move on a little bit. So why is this kind of key? So remember that um, with breathing in humans, I guess animals in general, um, you think about negative pressure breathing. So what does that mean? So what that means is that in the human body, uh, you generate pressure that is less than the pressure outside. So it creates a vacuum for air to go in. And that's why inspiration in part is kind of uh, mostly passive and expiration is, is um, kind of active, so to speak. So with quiet breathing, the diaphragm would do most of the work, 75% of the work, and the rest of it will be in, in external intercostals. But with expiration, it's the natural elastic kind of recoil of the lungs and thorax. So it just basically goes back to its normal shape, like, a, like an elastic band, so to speak, in order to kind of push that, uh, that air out and to get rid of that carbon dioxide. So, but however, in the case of like, you know, the, uh, if you think about those with difficulties uh, inhaling or exhaling, you think about the additional kind of respirate, well, not typically respiratory muscles, but muscles that would help with regards to the whole inspiration and expiration process. So the kind of classical dichotomy that you would think about would be the blue bloaters and the, uh, the pink puffers. So what would be some examples of some ex additional muscles used in inspiration? You can type it in or you can shout it out, it's up to you. Uh, external intercostals. Um, the external intercostals are more with quiet breathing, but they could be uh, exercised a bit more. Yeah, scaling muscles, the SEM, innervated by cranial nerve 11. Um, what about for expiration? So think about tightening your gut. So with uh, expiration, yeah, uh, internal intercostals and yeah, abdominal muscles would help with the forced expiration and this kind of breathing scenario. Okay, moving on. So let's talk about the pneumothorax or the common causes, so to speak. So obviously the, the common causes you would think about either is the spontaneous uh, pneumothorax in tall, thin males, as well as the tension pneumothorax, which is more of like a, a medical emergency, so to speak. So the ones in red are those that they kind of expect you to at least keep in mind, even in your preclinical years, but also to kind of think about as you progress onto the wards as well. Um, but essentially any kind of condition, whether primary or secondary, that could disrupt that uh, integrity of the pleura that was discussed earlier, and or lead to a leakage of air into the thorax could facilitate the pneumothorax, so to speak. 
All right, any questions thus far? Okay, moving on. So how does a pneumothorax kind of come about? Well, it comes from the atmosphere or air from the atmosphere really, for whatever reason through to some hole or some trauma or some structural dis instability would lead to the air from the atmosphere where the atmosphere naturally has a higher pressure to go into the thorax. And remember pressure like fluids, they kind of go against the gradient. So from high to low, so to speak. So when the air, so that's one way, but if it were to come within the thorax, so within the lung parenchyma, it's usually due to a rupture uh, in the apices, usually due to some already existing lung pathology, secondary to any lung pathology. And in terms of the tension pneumothorax, it's something that's described as a ball valve mechanism that quickly promotes um, the inspiratory uh, assembly of gases within the pleural. And so let's talk about lung volumes a little bit. So would anyone like to kind of roughly explain what they are? I mean, like numerically, you kind of see it there, but generally what does one or maybe two of these volumes or capacities, what would they mean? So, okay, one person asked, why does homocystinuria predispose to uh, a pneumothorax? Um, I think that relates more to a more of a genetic cause of a pneumothorax, a genetic kind of predisposition to occurring a pneumothorax similar to, well, not similar, but um, in the same manner that how a connective tissue disorder can predispose patients to get uh, a pneumothorax, um, but uh, that is something I guess kind of doing, uh, I guess for me as well to do some of my own homework on it as well. But okay, moving on. So yeah, tidal volume, very good, is the amount of air that you breathe in one time, one respiratory cycle. It's also a good assay of the general physiological status of the respiratory centers and the respiratory muscles and just the biophysics and mechanics of the lung and thoracic wall itself. Uh, yep, residual volume, very good B, is the amount of air remaining in the lungs after you try to force uh, air out with forced exhalation. Uh, sorry, my mistake. So with inspiratory volume, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's correct. Thank you. Uh, forcibly inhaled, yeah, after the tidal volume has occurred. Um, and that's about two to three liters actually within an adult. Um, so the column on the right is a bit of a kind of a trick question because, uh, well, unless someone wants to answer, uh, what would the volumes or capacities, how would they change in the context of a pneumothorax? So with regards to a pneumothorax, it's actually, they all decrease, they all go down, except for the tidal volume, which could remain normal, depending on the size of the pneumothorax and comorbidities within the lung. So remember the, the, the this degree of the pneumothorax, it depends on the overall size of the hole uh, within, within the thorax or within, yeah, So let's talk about some 
acid-based physiology and how the respiratory system kind of plays a role, but also, I guess, a little bit how the renal system kind of plays a role as well. So let's talk about what the main buffers of the human body are. It's like three general substances within the body that helps uh, maintain or minimize uh, fluctuations within pH. What are they? Yep, bicarbonate, very good. Uh, 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 well, bicarbonate is one of them, but I guess by extension, bicarbonate or the carbon dioxide balance does play a role in the buffer. Uh, but what are the other two? They're more like substantial stuff. So like the core of red blood cells, which are hemoglobin. Yep, very good. As well as proteins in general, because proteins by nature are, uh, can have charges with them. Um, so let's think about the general trends and the links that are provided there gives you a, uh, something to explore with regards to your own kind of practice to interpreting arterial blood gases. Essentially with pH, you kind of want it to be between 7.5 to 7.45, generally speaking. Um, but uh, with regards to say metabolic um, acidosis, what would happen aside from the obvious decrease in pH? Yeah, you would have decreased bicarbonate. And CO2, yeah, would decrease in this case. CO2 would decrease in metabolic acidosis and the body will try to compensate. So remember with metabolic acidosis, the, there's nothing really wrong with the lungs. It's more of an metabolic problem, whether it's something affecting the kidneys or maybe a diabetic ketoacidosis. So as a result, the respiratory system in this case will work to correct that in the forms of hyperventilation. Uh, with metabolic alkalosis, you can expect the opposite to, kind of, to occur. So pH will go up, PCO2 would increase, uh, because they're trying to, the respiratory system is trying to reduce the amount of alkylation. Carbonate would increase because that's the cause of the metabolic alkalosis. And also there will be an immediate compensation via hypoventilation. So just in the interest of time, this is kind of like what the general trend is, but with regards to metabolic versus respiratory, if you were to look at an ABG, Metabolics, pH and PCO2 would go in the same general trend. Whereas with regards to the respiratory acidoses and alkaloses, they would go in the opposite trends. Uh, I know it may be a bit confusing, um, but uh, let's move on for a little bit. So this is kind of some uh, visual kind of dichotomies to help explain uh, blood alkalosis and blood ac acidosis in terms of uh, their causes, their findings on readings, um, their, and also how they may present in terms of clinical presentations. So what would be one or two cause of respiratory acidosis? Okay, so 
COPD, yeah, yeah. So any kind of lung diseases, so COPD, um, acute respiratory distress syndrome, even the pneumothorax that we were discussing earlier would lead to respiratory acidosis. Um, what about alkalosis? What's one, maybe a couple causes of that? Yep, pneumonia, sepsis, uh, yep, those can be causes because you're essentially, infection in general would lead to a respiratory alkalosis. Other things to keep in mind would be heart attack, pains, um, even pulmonary embolism, which we'll talk upon later in this kind of revision. Uh, but then what would emphysema cause? Emphysema, because it's, uh, it's, it's interesting because COPD is actually kind of linked to both respiratory acidosis and respiratory alkalosis. So it, it, it kind of really depends on kind of like the chronology of how long the COPD has been going on for and how uh, extensive the respiratory kind of pathophysiological changes have been occurring. And so, uh, with regards to emphysema, so with emphysema, there's like actual dilation, there's actual enzymatic kind of destruction, um, so, so to speak, with the, uh, with the int integrity of the lung structures. Uh, and so I think it, it, it may lead to uh, alkalosis in the, in the end term. So now let's talk about the anion gap. Does anyone know the general formula uh, for calculating anion gap? Or which ions would you would use to calculate anion gap? Yep, very good. And extra points for including potassium. Uh, at least in the ED setting, um, potassium doesn't really do much to to influence the anion gap, but it, but but you're not wrong. Uh, but the three essential things is sodium, chloride, and bicarbonate. And the reason why the anion gap is important is because it's used to evaluate the extensiveness of the acidosis and to see if there are any anions that aren't taken into account. Uh, that would normally be picked upon by the urine, uh, urea electrolytes creatinine kind of blood tests. And usually what's, what's the actual, I guess, protein slash anion is the major unmeasured thing when calculating for anion gap. Does anyone know? I said, I said protein, um, but ammonia is not a bad guess. Usually the body is really good with ammonia metabolism. Yeah, albumin, very good. So albumin is the one that actually contributes pretty much the, uh, the majority to the anion gap in terms of unmeasured anion. Um, the other one would be phosphate, but that's not as important. Um, but this is something to think about when you're thinking about a high anion gap acidosis in patients with low albumin, uh, because it can actually deceptively appear as a normal anion gap, but you got to take account, how is this patient's protein level? Like, is, is this patient have enough albumin? Does this patient have some uh, some uh, hydrostatic issues with regard to bloods linked to like peripheral edema or things like that. So as you progress through your, your learning phase, as well as what you see on the wards, that's where you can kind of see, uh, you know, whether or not, um, you know, what's really going on in this case. Uh, the anion gap kind of varies depending on which essay you use, but it's typically between four to 12 
millimoles per liter if you measure mm -hmm. by ion selective electrode, or eight to 16 if measured by the flame photometry thing. Um, and then moving on, this is kind of like a general kind of algorithm, so to speak, with regards to uh, pH in the blood and anion gaps. So now let's talk about the ventilation perfusion mismatch. So normally, you know, you, you breathe in oxygen and normally that uh, you sorry you breathe in air and the oxygen from the air would be enough to perfuse red blood cells so that those red blood cells when they return through the pulmonary veins into the left atrium and then through the mitral valve into the left ventricle and ultimately systemic circulation that would normally be enough to you know perfuse and supply the body with enough oxygen for an aerobic respiration but uh what would happen if ventilation were to be less than perfusion? Or to kind of help find, make the question more specific, what would happen to the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli if ventilation is less than perfusion. So if ventilation were to be less than perfusion, that means that less carbon dioxide is being breathed out. And, you know, with regards to gases in the body, think of it as like trying to compete for real estate, so to speak. That's, that's where the whole partial pressure is really, really is, at least to me, is like trying to compete for like real estate within the thorax. So in this case, um, carbon dioxide is taking up more of the real, real estate. Oxygen is taking up less. That means that oxygen is being less delivered. Um, and as a result, partial pressures of oxygen in the alveoli would decrease. And if ventilation or if V were to be greater than Q, the partial pressure of oxygen would rise uh, because there's now less oxygen entering the blood. It's still within the kind of alveoli, sure, but there's not enough red blood cells to receive the oxygen uh, to then lead to the whole uh, proper perfusion of, you know, the red blood cells uh, and later supplying the rest of the body with, um, you know, necessary oxygen for aerobic respiration. Um, generally, on average, the VQ in a normal lung would be a more or less one. But at the top or the apex of the lung, uh, would it be higher or lower than one? Just think about the whole air kind of passage from superior to inferior through, you know, through the various trees. Yeah, it would be higher, approximately three. Um, and that just means like there's just a little bit of wasted ventilation. And by uh, the natural kind of, you know, pathophysiology, uh, sorry, not pathophysiology, but the natural physiology, the ventilation perfusion at the bottom of the lung would be less than one, uh, which would be essentially a wasted perfusion. Uh, that's, that's kind of something to kind of keep in mind because certain bugs that infect the human body, they actually thrive on lower or higher oxygen kind of environments. Um, so, for example, tuber tuberculosis would thrive in the high oxygen kind of uh, environment, so high ventilatory areas within the lung, so within the apex of the lungs. So just something to kind of keep in mind if you were to see consolidation in a chest x-ray, as well as the patient likely presenting with some weird infective signs.
So this is more or less kind of describing the more or less the similar things, what we talked about, but in the context of a normal thorax. So with a pneumothorax, um, it doesn't really cause that much disruption um, within, uh, in terms of the, pul the pulmonary kind of physiology. Um, in fact, uh, arterial blood gases would typically not be done acutely for pneumothorax. Uh, because they would obviously try to manage the pneumothorax first, uh, especially in the case of a tension pneumothorax, which is a medical emergency. Um, but I guess if one back in the old days were to do a uh, sort of study, so to speak, this is kind of what would occur in terms of the longitudinal aspects of the pathophysiology of a pneumothorax. So now let's talk about respiratory failure. So would anyone like to kind of volunteer what's uh, type uh, type one versus type two? So it really depends on the level of one, partial oxygen, and two, partial carbon dioxide. In both types, partial oxygen is low. That's pretty much the definition of respiratory failure. Similarly, how cardiac failure is determined by the heart working, but not really meeting the demands of the body. So in this case, PaO2 in both cases would be reduced, essentially uh, less than less than 50 to 60, depending on your textbook. But essentially, it's just not, it's not, the oxygen is not being acquired or being uh, distributed uh, appropriately. Uh, and now, uh, let's talk about when uh, type 1 versus type 2. So in type 1, what would the partial pressure of carbon dioxide be like? So the partial pressure of oxygen in terms of a type one respiratory failure would be low. And the reason why that's the case is because in type one respiratory failure, there is a ventilation perfusion mismatch. So that could be due to various reasons such as pneumonia, uh, pulmonary edema, pulmonary embolism, asthma, emphysema, acute respiratory distress syndrome. But now let's talk about the type two kind of failure, which is where you have normal or even elevated um, carbon dioxide, partial pressures of carbon dioxide. And that's because the alveoli are being underventilated, hypoventilated, which means that there is more trapping of carbon dioxide within the alveoli. Um, and the thing is that a type one respiratory failure can transform or evolve into a type two respiratory failure if you have the actual fatigue within your uh, respiratory muscles as well as the muscles involved for the forced breathing, so to speak. Um, and so other lung conditions such as the uh, chronic sort of longitudinal uh, sequelae of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, asthma, pulmonary fibrosis, the, and also just whatever it can lead to reduce respiratory drive to get rid of that carbon dioxide, such as something neuro-related, 
or drugs could lead to that type two um, respiratory failure. So now let's talk about um, oxygen therapy in the context of respiratory failure. Um, would you use it in type one, type two, or, or both? So in terms of oxygen therapy, you can give it in type one, uh, even though the hypoxemia or low oxygen within the blood may be relatively low and, uh, sorry, resistant to supplemental oxygen, but you still try to give it anyway, uh, because at least in this context, um, you want to help perfuse the patients as much as possible. Uh, better to be over than less. But uh, again, there are some conditions where oxygen as a drug. Um, so, okay, yeah, no worries. So I think it'll be easy to go on to the next slide. So with type one respiratory failure, it's all about ventilation perfusion mismatch. So partial pressure of oxygen is reduced and partial pressure of carbon dioxide would be uh, reduced as well, because there's something that is kind of uh, interfering with the whole uh, obtaining oxygen or perfusing of red blood cells. So that's why both PaO2 and PaCO2 would go down. But in carbon dioxide, um, like type one, uh, oxygen would be down, partial pressure of oxygen would be down, but uh, carbon dioxide would either stay relatively normal or increase uh, because you now have a mechanical uh, problem with regards to carbon dioxide clearance, if that makes sense. All right, so going back to the, the pneumothorax, uh, even though someone may have like a general idea of how to treat a pneumothorax, but let's take things step by step for a bit. So what are the general goals with regards to, uh, you know, a pneumothorax? What do you want to accomplish when managing a pneumothorax? So with regards to management of a pneumothorax, um, you want to uh, relieve pressure on the lungs because now there's increased pressure due from outside air coming in so that it's no longer pushing on lungs so they can re-expand again. And if possible, you want to prevent whatever may cause the pneumothorax from occurring again. So if the actual pneumothorax is relatively small, you just sit and wait with chest x-rays and see if that hole is being, you know, uh, reduced over time. Uh, this is known as kind of like a spontaneous recovery. But typically you would uh, use the needle aspiration or a chest tube insertion, which is a bit more invasive. And the reason why there's this image of the kind of intercostal layers in anatomy here is because you want to be careful when inserting the needle so that you don't mess the neurovascular kind of bundle uh, that is kind of kind of uh, adjacent to the ribs. Um, but essentially with regards to a needle aspiration, you literally just insert a needle and take a syringe to get rid of excess air into the needle aspiration. Uh, but uh, you would leave the actual catheter in there for a few hours uh, just to be sure that the lung has re-expanded or has gained its natural ability to expand. Because as mentioned before, the last thing you want to happen is a recurrence of the pneumothorax, so to speak. If 
for whatever reason, the pneumothorax or the chest tube insertion doesn't work, then you may close it with some medic with some uh, chemicals or with some surgery if, if, if the insertion or if the needle aspiration kind of doesn't seem to work all that well. So any questions on what we've discussed thus far? Okay, well, I think um, now would be a good time for a little bit of a five minute break. Um, so let's uh, reconvene in about um, sort of five to 10 minutes, if that's okay. Cool, is, uh, is everyone back? All refreshed and stuff? Right, cool, thank you. So just to answer um, Simran's question, uh, apologies if I, admit, if I butchered the pronunciation of that name. So the Bohr and Haldane effect, they describe the whole um, diffusion affinities for certain things. So with regards to the Bohr effect, it's, it's about how the, within the tissues, um, uh, the red blood cells have a certain affinity for, for oxygen, how that kind of affects its, um, not just its oxygen diffusion to the tissues, but also its uh, accumulation of carbon dioxide after it's done perfusing the, uh, the tissues themselves. Whereas the Haldane effect is the opposite where it describes about the natural carbon dioxide affinity um, but, but that's also to kind of help explain why the within the lungs, um, their carbon dioxide um, kind of, you know, gets, you know, released because now the, 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 the red blood cells are now, instead of taking up, uh, getting rid of carbon dioxide, they're now taking up oxygen. So with the Bohr effect, it's at the peripheral tissue level, and that's all about, uh, oxygen affinity and with the lungs uh, and with the how Dane effect that is within the lungs and that's all about carbon dioxide affinity with regards to the processes of uh, peripheral perfusion and gas exchange in the lungs respectively if that helps clear these things up. Okay, cool. Now let's move on to the DVT or pulmonary embolism. So uh, generally with DVT slash pulmonary embolism, it's, it's primarily a weird clotting issue. That's, uh, but uh, usually a, a DVT would lead to a pulmonary embolism. Uh, but also you can get weird other forms of a pulmonary embolism, mm -hmm. such as a paradoxical uh, pulmonary embolism as well. Uh, but essentially uh, with uh, an emboli, you can think about six general causes of an emboli. Does anybody want to give a crack at what any of those letters could stand for? So with F, it's kind of pretty obvious. It's, it's fat, um, usually after a bone fracture of some kind. Um, a, the first A stands for air. The first T stands for uh, just a thrombus, so a local kind of clot that ended up being embolized. Uh, B stands for a bacterial kind of infection sequelae. The second A is for amniotic fluid that can lead to a disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. And T is, is tumor. So when thinking about clots, you need to think about the Verkhaus triad with regards to thrombosis. So 
periods of prolonged stasis, so such as post-op, in bed, uh, and or traveling, though not that we can really travel anywhere, um, uh, but hopefully we can soon. Any structural disruption of the endothelium, the inner wall lining of the vessels, and any kind of condition that a patient may have that can lead to excess um, hypercoagulability or increased likelihood of, of clotting. So this kind of ties into when terminating pulmonary embolism, if it's provoked or unprovoked. With provoked, it's kind of obvious because you just need to think of VERC, any one to three of Vertical's triad that could lead to a provoked pulmonary embolism. But what about unprovoked? I.e., what could lead or what kind of conditions could predispose a patient to getting a pulmonary embolism? So you think about cancers, you would think about uh, some pregnancies, you would think about some really weird coagulation disorders like uh, surgeries, yeah, yeah, surgeries. Um, though again, surgeries would lead to the whole stasis thing. Um, so that's still kind of provoked. We're talking about anything outside of those workhouse triads. So cancers, pregnancies, obesities, uh, even heart failure, some weird infections, things like that. So now let's talk about uh, the micro versus the macro. So with A in the top left, in terms of the macro or the pathological specimen, you now have a thromboambulus in the, pay, in the main pulmonary artery with layered appearance typical of a thrombus that has originated from a lower, large vein of the lower peripheral limbs. And in terms of the microscopy to its immediate right, you have those weird diagonal lines here that kind of uh, looks like cracks in the wood, so to speak. They're known as the lines of Zahn. So with B, what you have here is a fibrous brand, fibrous band from a remote organized pulmonary thromboembolus, as well as in the arrow, uh, uh, sorry, in uh, with this arrow, you also have a little bit of an atheromatous plaque of the pulmonary artery into my the right. So the bands by the white arrow and the plaques within the box here. Uh, and B, it just shows a recanalized channel and A is the lines of Zahn. So would anyone care to have a crack at an explanation for any one of these symptoms? Like, you know, like when you think of pulmonary embolism, you think of pleuritic chest pain on like the history or on the admission, but why would you have the pleuritic chest pain, so to speak? It's similar to why you have a uh, crushing tightness chest pain with myocardial infarction. So that's due to a reduced circulation to the lung peripheries, which obviously if you under perfuse or if you reduce the supply to something, it becomes ischemic and it could infarct. And as a result of that, it could irritate the somatic nerve endings within the parietal pleura. And remember the parietal pleura is very good at localizing pain uh, and stuff. 
With shortness of breath, it's usually, it's due to a reduced pulmonary arterial or arterial blood flow, which leads to decreased delivery of the carbon dioxide to the lungs for exhalation and decreased delivery of deoxygenated blood to the alveoli for oxygenation, which in turn leads to stimulation of chemoreceptors, which would lead to the whole sort of sequelae of the um, respiratory center reflex to lead to increased respiratory rate and tachypnea. Uh, if you're familiar with syncope or presyncope, it's just that the sequence of a PE could lead to a trans, uh, so sort of like a, uh, a global hypoperfusion of the brain, of the, of the cerebral circulation. Um, and hemoptysis is, again, another kind of consequence of the infarction of the tissues within the pleura leading to blood in the airways that needs to be coughed up. So these are kind of some of the additional kind of findings that you may have on uh, with someone with pulmonary embolism, usually due to the causes of a pulmonary embolism or the predisposition for a pulmonary embolism. So anything that can lead to a particular infection or anything that could lead to some disruption uh, or, uh, or effect of this general cardiovascular circulation itself could lead to some of these additional findings in addition to someone with a pulmonary embolism. So D-dimers, as you know, is your go-to kind of test to assess the degree of risks for pulmonary embolism or the uh, risk of just clotting in general. But uh, aside from D, uh, but aside from, uh, uh, was it aside from you know the Wells criteria? What's another kind of score that patient or that clinicians use to um, assay kind of clotting risk? So that would be known as the Chats to Vas score, which is kind of important when you're thinking about coagulation risk, particularly for things like a mechanical valve or atrial fibrillation. Um, but does anybody know what the D-dimer is? Like what naturally produces a D-dimer? Or why, do you, why is there D-dimer in the first place? It all kind of ties into the clotting and anticoagulation balance within the body. So obviously once you have a clot to form that plugs up whatever disruption or damage to the endothelial structure, as well as now that the plug's been hold and there's no risk of bleeding out, you want to get rid of that clot. So that's why the body has its own kind of endogenous thrombolysis to get rid of the clots. And one of the byproducts of you know, this fibrin clot is the D-dimer. Um, and with regards to D-dimers, is it sensitive? Is it specific? Is it both? So with D-dimers, it's very high in sensitivity, um, but it's very low in specificity. Um, but uh, that's something to kind of keep in mind when you want to rule in or rule out pulmonary embolism. And if you're really not sure if it's a pulmonary embolism, that's where you would go with a slightly more invasive cardiothera uh, with corn, uh, CT pulmonary angiogram. 
So with CTPA, that enables direct visualization of a thrombus within the pulmonary artery. Uh, and out of all the non-invasive imaging methods, uh, the CT, well, I, I guess invasive is kind of relative, but I guess a non-surgical imaging method or non-stressful uh, imaging method, then CTPA has the best kind of accuracy. Um, but if there's nothing on CTPA and you still aren't sure, that's when you would go with the ventilation perfusion scheme. Um, so with regards to management, you want to first and foremost, make sure the patient is stable. That's where the whole doctors A, B, C, and doctors A, B, C, D will come into play. You would want to get them on fibrinolytics prophylactically, even if ultimately at the end of all this, they don't have a clot, they don't have a clot that's within their, uh, within their lungs. You still want to give it because in terms of risk benefits thing, it's better to resolve a clot than to leave it hanging, so to speak. Um, but if that doesn't seem to resolve everything, you would go with alternative therapies like fibrinolytics, um, actual surgical removal of the clot, uh, if more extreme, actual removal of the uh, lungs surrounding the clot. Uh, but last but not least, you want to make sure you restore ischemia. Uh, sorry, you restore the oxygenation to, uh, to the lungs just like how you would want to try to restore proper coronary circulation in the context of the acute management of a myocardial infarction. But once they're stable, and once that, you know, that the clot is likely not going to uh, relapse, you still want to prevent it. And that's why you would put these patients on some anticoagulation medications. Um, for about a couple of weeks, I would say. So with apixaban, rivaroxaban, those are the NOAX, those are the direct factor 10 activated uh, uh, factor inhibitors. Uh, warfarin is the vitamin uh, K, uh, well, actually the vitamin K enzyme inhibitor. And everything else is just uh, heparin to some degree. So to prevent further stasis, one, you need to help the patient move about if they can, but whether or not they can, you may think about providing some compression stockings, um, uh, especially to the legs. You also want to make sure that whatever the initial cause for endothelial injury, remember to keep in mind a Burkhouse triad gets addressed. So if there's cancer, treat it. If the patient still smokes, you get them to stop. And also you want to ensure that the body doesn't get into a hypercoagulative state. So, so when you think about post-op management, you think about prevention of DVT, with, which may or may not involve prophylactic uh, anticoagulation. You want to, again, think about cancer as well, because uh, cancer can lead to a hypercoagulable state. Uh, if the patient's on OCPs, you want to think about weighing them off. And if there's something really out there, like antiphospholipid syndrome, you also want to address that as well. So this is pneumonia or upper res uh, for lower respiratory tract infections. So more or less similar with regards to any kind of infection, you want to first uh, manage their symptoms. So like their fevers, their, their shakes, their chills, their uh, dehydration, their, their clamminess. Um, you also want to get them started on some prophylactic antibiotics as well. Uh, start with broad spectrum and after doing some 
random blood cultures and if necessary a fecal occult uh blood a fecal occult cultures or midstream urine cultures then provide the more targeted antibiotics for them and also need to determine which route would be optimal in terms of the need to address those symptoms and or get rid of the infective etiological organism as well as the safety of providing those medications. So you need to keep in mind with regards to first pass and I guess second pass metabolism, i.e. how well are the patient's kidneys, how well are the patient's liver, or are they both kind of compromised, so to speak. Right, no worries. Um, so now let's think about how you would classify a pneumonia or what's one, what's one organism that uh, would commonly lead to uh, pneumonia and one you don't normally think about with regards to pneumonia. So obviously uh, streptococcus pneumoniae, as the name implies, is a kind of st strep bacteria. Uh, which could lead to the lower respiratory tract infections. You also want to think about other causes of pneumonia, i.e. ones that are um, kind of not likely to happen unless the patient were to be immunocompromised or if they're in like a certain setting like community acquired pneumonia or hospital acquired pneumonia. Uh, if you want to kind of further define what hospital acquired pneumonia is, it means not present or incubating prior to admittance to the hospital, but it can occur 48 hours after uh, admission. And this is with regard to hospital or healthcare associated pneumonia. So there's a, a vast list of, of microorganisms that can lead to a pneumonia. Uh, so in alcoholics, you would think about uh, Klebsiella, uh, particularly because anaerobes due to the whole aspiration. So chronic alcoholics, alcoholics are binge streakers. They can, you know, they're known to kind of choke on their own kind of vomit and stuff. IV drug users, you think about the kind of organisms that would not normally be introduced within the body, but because of the uh, sort of the sex drugs and rock and roll kind of culture of these drug users, uh, you would think about things like S. pneumoniae or S. aureus uh, being reintroduced within the body that can lead to the pneumonia. Again, with aspiration, talking about alcoholics, you're thinking about anaerobes. For atypical, you would think about mycoplasma, legionella, uh, chlamydia. For cystic fibrosis, due to the excess kind of mucus accumulation within the thorax, you think about pseudomonas, again, staph aureus, and strep pneumoniae. And with regards to the post viral, you again think about those similar organizations of staph and strep, but also hemophilus influency. With HIV immune deficiency, you would think about the fungal infections, which is the Nimbocystis gyrovici. And tropical regions, it's you really don't have to know, but it's uh, Burkholderia pseudomale, Acinetobacter balmani, and I'm pretty sure I pushed up butchered those names, but that's how low you they are, I guess. So with regards to pathological and radiopathological classification, you think about whether it's bronchopneumonia or lobar pneumonia. Um, so with regards to lobar pneumonia, the most common causes are staph, uh, sorry, strep and Klebsiella pneumoniae because of the way their bacterial cycle, so speaks, it kind of vegetates itself within the lobes of the lungs. So on chest x-ray, 
Uh, obviously, the right side is normal compared to the left side. So within the left side, there is a clear radial opacification of the lead midzone, and that's because the alveoli and small airways are filled with dense kind of material, usually kind of some accumulated uh, bacterial products, so to speak. Uh, but essentially what you got here is the consolidation, typical of a, well, typical pneumonia, low bar pneumonia. And now let's talk about bronco pneumonia, which is a bit more uh, disseminated, so to speak, in terms of its presentation. So it's scattered, it's patchy, it's usually around the actual bronchiolar tree, the trees. So it's found in more areas within the lungs compared to just that one lobe. And as opposed to strep pneumonia or klebsiella, you think about the staph, you think about the hemophilus, you think about pseudomonas, and you think about legionella. And so what you would see here are the, especially on the right side, the multiple small nodular or reticulonodular opacities, which tend to be patchy and or confluent. And this could either be bilateral, so it can affect both sides, but you can definitely see this is more asymmetric or on the right side of the body. So when you think about atypical, you think about the interstitial pneumonia. So the actual interstitium of the lungs are infiltrated. And so basically these patients, they don't really have that much of the fever or a systemic kind of presentation of pneumonia, which also adds to why it's referred to as atypical pneumonia but they may have some relatively mild upper respiratory tract infective symptoms. So a little bit of a productive cough, um, but on chest, uh, chest uh, x-ray, remember that the inflammation is really limited to the respiratory interstitium. So even though this one is also patchy, but it's like diffuse and disseminated within the lungs, this is more within the reticular nodules or very focused kind of uh, opacities on chest x-ray. Um, if you wanna see more evidence of this kind of pneumonia, I would recommend radiopedia, though you probably know that already. So these are kind of the risk factors. Um, need to know a little bit about them, but common things are common. And uh, you need to know about some of the risk factors to uh, pneumonia, age, already existing chronic pulmonary disease, um, active smoking, alcohol abuse, uh, certain types of medications, um, as well as sort of the extra corporeal things like travel, uh, especially travel without lack of prophylactic immunizations. Um, as well as, you know, picking up your children from school and stuff. No worries. Uh, these are some of the symptoms and signs, um, more or less very obvious. Uh, wish you could be on placements to really see these for yourself, but you can kind of read up about it and the slides will be distributed later. Investigations. Pretty staple stuff, full blood examination, UEC in the case of like Legionella streptococcal, but again, that's more in the extreme case of sepsis. And if you think a UTI is the primer, C-reactive protein, chest X-rays, uh, uh, but in terms of antigens, you would look at for Legionella and strep. But again, that's in the case of septic UTI usually. Uh, AVGs, we kind of covered that a little bit already, um, but these are some of the antibiotics that you would consider with regards to the pneumonia. So you don't, you want to start off with general broad spectrum stuff first to see if that works, whether they're a bit more resilient or if you know exactly what you're dealing with in terms of the uh, microbiological investigations done then you would consider the more extreme stuff like ceftriazone class four or azithromycin. Uh, 
So obviously, as opposed to treating the infection, you want to uh, prevent it. You can't really prevent it for things like, you know, uh, uh, for, for strap, but you can at least minimize it uh, with uh, making sure that in a hospital or a community acquired setting, that things are done uh, to uh, minimize uh, them. So obviously things like over, uh, like going ham with antibiotics is a bad thing. Excessive or improper sanitization is another thing. With regards to the uh, virus stuff, then vaccinations is obviously the important thing. Uh, so with restrictive lung diseases, um, it's it's a typically classified on spirometry with an FEV1 or FEC to FEC ratio that is normal or higher than expected. Whereas in obstructive, the FAV1 is markedly reduced compared to FVC. So the main difference between asthma and COPD is whether or not it's reversible, particularly if you want to do a peak, uh, if you do either spirometry or peak flow, if they improve after applying the medications, uh, usually some Ventolin or asthma. Uh, but this affects something called the alveolar arteriolar gradient. So that's the difference in partial pressures of oxygen within the alveolus and the pulmonary arteriole. Um, and normally within a young, healthy adult, it's between five to 10. Uh, but obviously things like trapping of air or uh, VQ mismatch or cardiogenic defects like a right to left shunt could lead to interest to the uh, derangement of an alveolar arterial gradient. So this is just some complex stuff with regards to the physiology, which you can read on your own time. Uh, but essentially with regards to things like the type two pneumocytes, the uh, uh, sort of the active inspiration and passive expiration these are some things that they may work and look into um, with regards to determining the type of pulmonary disease as affecting the patient. Hemoglobin, we kind of touched upon a little bit, but essentially you need to be able to know what causes a left versus a right shift. So you need to look at things about temperature. You want to look about things about pH. You want to look at things such as BPG. Um, but also know about other things. So for example, how myoglobin has only one unit, whereas hemoglobin has four subunits and the more oxygen that binds to it, the more it has an affinity for oxygen and how fetal homoglobin compared to adult hemoglobin has a naturally higher affinity for oxygen because the baby needs to have that oxygen for that, you know, that precious, sweet, sweet aerobic respiration. So with asthma, um, uh, if you're thinking about, for example, beta blockers in cardiovascular patients with like heart failure or hypertension, then you think about beta agonists for the case of uh, asthma or some patients with COBD because they function to essentially open up the airways, they bronchodilate um, um, and stuff. So, yeah. This is kind of just a general diagnostic overview of uh, which medications to use for asthma and COPD. This is kind of visual kind of summary of all the asthma COPD uh, medications. So National Asthma Council of Australia. Um, this is kind of like a survey that what TFI and I are doing um, because we really want to see how we can address the gaps with regards to the Australia and New Zealand uh, medical education system. Um, obviously don't do it now because it's the end of the day and you probably wanna have dinner and stuff, but uh, something to kind of keep in mind and distribute amongst your peers. But that's pretty much it all for me. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule.
Um, uh, and the next session will be delivered by the honorary lecturer, uh, Jamie Engel, a final year Monash medical student who is very passionate about nephrology and someone that I know to be very good at teaching. So um, that's that's kind of pretty much it for me. So thank you so much for your uh, for your attention and have a good one.